Now let's say a few words about the SNL crisis of the 80s that served as a trigger to the introduction of a comprehensive system of bank regulation in the United States and simultaneously around the globe. Uh, first of all, the SNL crisis has been widely studied and I have to mention here that the subtitle to our course, Other People's Money, is taken from the title of a well-known book written about that by Paul Zane Pilzer that is just entitled Other People's Money. And uh, the story here goes like this, that uh, an SNL is the following institution. So this is a bank-like institution uh, that here is some equity, as we see hopefully. Then the main liability is the time deposit. So people uh, make deposits for some a more or less long period of time, maybe a year, maybe a couple of years, but uh, really in units of years. And its main assets are residential mortgages. So basically the idea, this is an SNL, Savings and Loans Association. The idea is that these people, they finance the homes of these people. And oftentimes, because they were arranged on a uh, regional principle, those were basically the same people. So let's say the dwellers of this region, county, uh, some of them who at the same time do not need to buy a new house, they could put some money on their savings account with the SNL and effectively they would finance these mortgages. Now, these are insured and they're insured by federal savings and loans insurance corporation. So basically we can see whenever there is uh, the deposit insurance, then there is a potential threat of moral hazard and we will see what kind, what special kind of a problem it took here. Now the setup for this in the 1970s and 80s was such that that was the time of uh, risk-taking, and deregulation. Well, that does not mean that before people were just risk averse and really conservative and they were highly regulated, but indeed there was some regulation in many areas of the US economy, in airlines, in insurance, in some other areas, in banking, but it was not the kind of regulation that would prevent problems that we are talking about right now. And then also this whole time, was the sort of jump start or jump restart of the US economy and people started to take more risks. This entrepreneurial spirit was really a core at this time. Uh, that also uh, coincided in time with the jump in the interest rates and that was the key trigger of the SNL crisis to occur. In order to talk about that, I will just flip over the chart and we'll reproduce that once again and we'll see what happens. Now again, this is equity at an SNL. This is the SNL simplified balance sheet. These are time deposits and these are residential mortgages. What if interest rates go up significantly like this? Then we see because the maturity and duration of residential mortgages is quite high. Their maturity is 30 years and then it can be shown that duration is sort of kind of long. Then the market value drops sharply as interest rates go up. So we can put it like this. It's a little bit exaggerated. But the key story is that you can see that the market value of these residential mortgages now is less than the market value of their liabilities because the market value of time deposits does not change that much. So that was the case that a lot of these SNLs became sort of as was called zombie organizations. So their equity was negative. Now you can see that uh, this pushes the management of this SNL to engage in very risky projects because if I arrive at the high state, then I, I might be back in the black. 
If I arrive at a low state, I was insolvent and I am insolvent. Who cares? So it's important to notice that this setup resulted in massive abuses based on this moral hazard situation. And the question is, how come that an institution that is actually insolvent can keep on going? And here we come to the, to the point of how regulation of these SNLs was arranged before. The key story was the so-called book value reporting. That means that even when that was already a zombie, in reports, the management could show the book value of these mortgages, this whole amount. And on paper, it was still solvent. Now, the fact that the, well, clearly, if you disclose that you are already insolvent, then you will be uh, obviously uh, set up to bankruptcy and disappear. You'll lose your job and then uh, your shareholders will lose money. So people had incentives to postpone this in the hope of seeing, let's say maybe the interest rates will go down and then this uh, will uh, be better for me and some other miracles, if you will. And the result is that pro the, these problems have accumulated for a while. And as oftentimes happens, it all, uh, this, it was not exactly a bubble. It was just the set of postponed serious problems. It burst and the overall check for finally the taxpayers, because deposits were insured, added up to 550 billion US dollars. Well, that all set up, uh, let's say, lay ground for comprehensive bank regulation that we will discuss in the episodes to come. But for now, I will stop here by adding just one more thing. It was, how, how many? About 20, 25 years have passed since. And in 2007, 2008, we saw another huge crisis that was global crisis dealing with a lot of powerful financial institutions. The main idea in which was still the same uh, moral hazard and inadequate regulation. So we can see that although regulators, they have really repaired a lot in the system, but they ever since have been lagging behind. But before, it's always easy to blame someone. Before we did so, we have to proceed from here and see what these people, the regulators around the globe, have done in ensure that massive problems like this will be much less likely to happen. In the next episode, we'll discuss bank regulation in much greater detail.